Hello, everybody, and happy Friday. Um, it is May 19th. It is Friday, so that means it's time for Find My Past Fridays. I hope everybody has had a great week. Um, and it is also my second week in a row hosting. Uh, so hopefully that is good news and not bad <laughs> news for everybody. Um, you know what? I'm just going to be honest. It's been a long one. It feels like this week is really kind of dragged on a bit. Um, and, and I've, I've been super busy. So, um, yeah, so it's, I'm, I'm tired. It's a, it's a tired Friday, find my past Friday. Um, we do have Ellie in the comments. Everybody say hello to Ellie, please. Um, she is just back from uh, a little holiday. Um, she was gone for a week, so I'm really happy that she's back now because it makes me sad when she leaves. Um, I'm happy for her, but I miss her. So, um, so welcome back, Ellie, and thanks for popping in uh, to do comments. We appreciate you. Uh, lots of you um, in the comments already saying hello. Thank you very much um, for being with us and um, and for joining us and, and engaging in the comments. Um, I will do a quick, let's see, a quick weather report. So um, Colorado is kind of cloudy today. And in fact, over my area of Colorado this morning, I woke up to a um, bad air quality warning. Um, so I'm not sure. I have to look into it. There may be a forest fire somewhere to the west of us, and it's kind of traveling over. That's usually how those things happen, but I haven't looked yet. Um, so some some not great air quality today in northern Colorado. Um, where is what's happening everywhere else in the world? Let's see. Um, uh, uh, we've got Lynn from BC and Anya's with us. And Gail is chiming in from Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. Thanks for being here. And Rowena is in Johannesburg. Andrew is in Lancashire. Janet in North Wales. Um, oh, Kim from a lovely West Yorkshire. And it's her birthday tomorrow. Happy birthday, Kim. I hope that you are celebrating in style and doing something fun. Like, I don't know, maybe exploring new records. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, uh, happy birthday, Kim. Um, and, and we wish you all the best on your special day. Um, and that's really, thank you for sharing that with us. Andrea's with us um, from Stoke on Trent. Victoria's with us. Um, Lynn and Joe and Sue, and it's sunny in Surrey, so that's good. Um, Jean is in Preston and Lancashire. Um, all sorts of people. This is good. Um, Gail is agreeing with me. Yes, it, it has been a long week for her as well. So, Gail, I hope you're able to like sleep in or something tomorrow or um, get some extra rest. Um, let's see. Um, Karen's with us in North London. Two archive visits this week. Okay. No complaining, Karen. That is delightful. I, 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 w I wish that archive visits were on my list. Um, you know, that's probably one of the disadvantages, right? I'm, I'm in Colorado and I get to do fantastic work for Fun My Past every week, but I have to send people to do those archive visits for me and I really just want to go play in the records. Um, so no complaining, Kim, <laughs> or Karen, sorry. <laughs> um, Heather is up in sunny Edinburgh. That's great. Um, Gail is here. Liam. Liam Boyle. Liam Boyle has had a very busy week as well uh, in our customer support team. Um, uh, and so everybody say hello to Liam and give him a little love today because um, it's been a, it's kind of it's been a long one, I think, for a couple of people. Ah, Roz explaining it to me. Massachusetts is getting smoke from the Canadian fire. So that is probably where some of mine is coming from, too, although I'll have to look it up and see because big difference between Colorado and Massachusetts. Um, but Roz, I hope everything's okay out there for you and um, and you're all right. Um, oh, Ellen's chiming in as well. So Roscoe's getting smoke from the Canadian fires too, yeah. All right, well, in that case, um, I really hope everybody in Canada is okay. It is uh, out in the West, we are getting into that um, wildfire season. Um, so it's always always an interesting experience, right? And, and sometimes a little bit scary. So, uh, yeah. Um, all right. Dan is in Lubbock, Texas with us. I don't know that I recognize your name, Dan. So welcome. I'm not sure if it's your first time with us or not, but always happy to have you. Um, let's see, California. Um, Kevin is in Texas as well. Robert just finished a thunderstorm. Gosh, there's so many of you today. This is great. Okay, cool. Um, I love it. 
So, of course, we're going to talk about new records. We're going to talk about our question of the week. Um, we're going to talk about new newspapers. And I thought the question of the week was actually really fun this this time. Um, I kind of came up with it at like two o'clock in the morning last night. Um, and I, you know, scrambled to write it down on the notepad next to my bed so I didn't forget it. So in the comments, as we go through new records, start thinking about this. The question of the week is this. Imagine you had a time machine and could witness one event from your family's past which event would you choose and why? Um, and I will just tell you that I was not able to choose just one. Um, so as we are going through um, today's materials, think about the question of the week. Let us know in the comments. Um, talk to each other about this. I wonder how many people we can find that have similar events in their family history and um, and maybe even make that trip together. It would be kind of cool. Okay, so... Uh, uh, with that, I am going to um, get started on, on new records. Um, so let me put this up. Thanks to Liam for actually helping create these PowerPoint slides for me this week. So quick little shout out to Liam. I appreciate that very much. Um, all right. Oh, Gail, this is good. I'm going to, I'm going to, Let's throw this comment up really quick. I've thumbed through my dad's files. I'm finding out more and more each time. I have also had that experience in the last couple of years. My dad finally shared his Navy record with me, like his full Navy record. And I just, oof. yes, good stuff. Um, all right. So I hope you're enjoying that, Gail. That's, that's cool. All right. This week's new records. Let's get into this. We are in Scotland this week. Um, and... I don't know if I'm going to try to pronounce this. I am. I'm going to go for it. The people of Narnshire, Narnshire, not Narnshire. If I just say it really fast, it sounds right, right? That's, um, I think that's what I've been told. Um, uh, so just over 4,000 new records. This is transcription only. And these records are actually produced by uh, one individual who, who then licenses them to us and shares them with us. Um, and he goes through the records by hand, kind of page by page, and creates these transcriptions for us to um, uh, to publish for all of our benefit. So he's, you know, he's a pretty incredible, like one man kind of, you know, powerhouse. Um, so uh, we had to find the county of interest on the map. I definitely did. I did not know where this one was. Um, these materials include name, year, place, publication title, and then just the additional information as, um, as it applies. Anya, this is amazing. Uh, she has family in this area. Nyronshire. I don't know. I'm not, I don't think I'm doing that right. I'm going to stop. <laughs> but um, this is a really fun little collection. So I'm um, really quite pleased. I had, I had a lot of fun looking through these. Um, so a couple of examples for you. This is Janet Smith um, found in this record set um, in 1790. And you can see the transcription is actually pretty straightforward, right? Her, it's her name and the date and the location, uh, including the parish. Um, but the notes section is where the interesting part goes in, right? So um, in this case, Janet is on the poor list. Um, so some of these entries are very straightforward and simple like this, but some of them um, are definitely a, a little bit more complex. Um, so another one, this is Widow Campbell in 1815. No first name for this woman. Um, just the, the fact that she is the widow of John Campbell. She's also on the poor list. Uh, and then um, we also have the Scotland Registers and Records, which is kind of connected to this other um, set. So this is a unique collection to find my past. These are an additional 244 pages, and these are via our PDF browser. So if you don't use that tool very often, definitely take a look at it. There's hundreds and hundreds of pages of PDFs on the Find My Past site. Um, and these are actually extracts from Kirk Session Minutes um, that are provided. So I just took one example um little shout out to mary actually on our team for helping me find this particular entry um and i was reading through and a lot of these people were just like on the poor list on the poor list on the poor list uh and then there are these other entries right so john callum in 1737 he's the stepson to john cameron he has an alias there and then um it records that he's been censured for making plays and cursing on the sabbath and then there's another one exact for the exact same reason, um, the son of Alexander Ross, 
his name is also Alexander Ross, same date, 1737, in an almost an identical alias, right? So um, I really wanted to know, like, are these two people connected? Like, what's going on here? I don't know. But you see a number of other entries in there, right? There are witnesses. There are um, uh, uh, Donald Ross there is identified as a new Kirk elder. Um, and then there's some fornication ac accusations in here. So there's all sorts of really wonderful context. Um, it puts your ancestor in a place in time, which is important for their timeline, but also gives you some really incredible social history. And then, of course, from here, you would want to go from our transcriptions back to the archive and actually see the original materials uh, and um, and get kind of that full picture and, and make sure that you're getting everything possible um, from those original records. So fun little sets for Scotland this week, for sure. We also added um, more materials to our Anglo-Boer War records. Um, we added um, a pretty big update. So the collection now has um, 383,000 names extracted from over 500 sources. Um, and we do know that there are over 400,000 soldiers who fought in this particular war, including many from Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. So remember that, you know, this is all part of British Empire at this point. Um, this is pre-Dominion status for Canada, um, for example. So um, a lot of opportunity here for research kind of across the empire. Um, uh, and obviously the uh, events are happening in Africa. So um, lots of really interesting material on this one. So a couple of examples here as well. You might recognize this guy, Arthur Conan Doyle, maybe, maybe. Um, he is listed in this entry because he um, had the rank of surgeon and he was stationed at Langman's Hospital. And then there's a little piece of biography there as well, of course, known as a fictional detective, uh, the author and creator of Sherlock Holmes. Um, but he also had material that was is directly related to this conflict. Um, so there's a little bit of interesting, in, you know, so a handful of interesting names in here. Uh, Winston Churchill is, of course, in this collection also. Um, um, but then I, I kind of dug through. I, of course, I'm always interested in that international angle, right? Um, I wanted to see if I could find a, a good example to share. So I, I found this guy really quite randomly, Sergeant W.H. Nels. Um, and I picked him actually because of the unit he's in, Strathcona's horse. Um, Strath Lord Strathcona, I know a bit about because he was um, uh, a prominent, I guess, prominent um, figure in Canadian history. Um, he also, and maybe even British history, I know about his Canadian parts. Um, but part of the area that my uh, Canadian ancestors are from is named after Lord Strathcona. And so I kind of have, in the past, I've done a little bit of digging around him and like, you know, why was he so influential in this particular part of Alberta? So I picked this guy randomly because he's in Strathcona's horse. And I was like, I know that name. Um, but you can see also, there's so much information about him in this index that I couldn't actually get it to fit nicely on the slide. I had to kind of chop it up. Um, but look, all the information out of the Gazetteer, uh, we have event notes, we have mention in dispatches and references, even down to the page numbers. You can go back to the London Gazette and actually find those references. Um, we have honors and awards. We have additional notes all sorts of information just in this one source. I mean, just this one page gives us, I don't know, maybe a dozen opportunities for additional research. Um, I went back and looked quickly. I mean, and I mean like in like 10 minutes or less, just to see if I could find him in our newspaper collection. The first thing I found was from the Army and Navy Gazette, um, and this is from 1901. So he's mentioned as part of Strathcona's horse, right? You see him there, number 517, Sergeant W.H. Nels. Um, and then, um, and this one's published obviously in London, right? So this is the British version. Um, and then we see him in the Civil and Military Gazette published in Lahore, which at first I was like, okay, it's a little bit repetitive, but actually it's a great chance for us to see kind of the diversity of our newspaper collection and a little bit of like, you know, it's worth looking at all of these papers published in different locations. Um, so this one is all, these are all from 1901, um, published in Lahore. This is from um, our newspaper collection as well. And it's actually referencing the fact that he's been given the Distinguished Con Conduct Medal 
right, for, for his um, actions in the war. And then lastly, and this is the one that's the sad one, right, um, the Saturday night publication from Toronto, Canada actually publishes um, about his death. Um, so he dies of a fever. Um, a, they explain a little bit of his bio. He's a soldier in Canada as well as in South Africa. He was an engineer and volunteered for his time in Strathcona's Horse, received a commission um, in the Commander-in-Chief's bodyguard. And they actually obviously had printed a picture, but the microfilm doesn't transfer over very well, unfortunately. So his face is pretty much blacked out um it's an it's an interesting photo but at the same time like it you know it's it's a fantastic way to say like we found this record about a you know a very standard kind of basic military record um the, which actually expanded on his his history quite a lot and then went into three different newspapers from three different countries um to you know, see more of his picture and understand his life and, and his activities. Um, it's an incredible little journey. And I did, like I said, I did this in just a few short minutes this morning. So imagine what you could do if you actually spent, you know, like the weekend or something with these records. Be really, really fun. Uh, so anyway, um, that is the Boyer War records that we released this week. So that leads me straight into, of course, newspapers. <laughs> We're back to publishing newspapers, so we have a handful of new titles this week and then and then a handful of updated titles as well. And you can see that that Scottish theme kind of carries through. Um, so if you have Scottish research, this is a great time to go back and, and take a look at some of these new materials and see if you can find something new and different. Um, but we did publish the Bayswater Chronicle, the Butman, the Citizen from Letchworth, uh, the Downham Market Gazette. The Loftus Advertiser and the Morshire Advertiser uh, this week, all new material uh, for you to play around with in the newspaper. So that's good. And then um, updates to New Milton and Easter Post and Sheerness and a handful of others. So really, really great updates to the newspaper collection this week as well. Okay, I think that's all the new record stuff. Um, hopefully, I know you guys have been going through um, the question of the week quite a lot, so we'll get to those quickly. Shirley, um, actually just saying, commenting. Oh, oops, that's the wrong one. Here we go. Um, I've just discovered three of my grandfather's siblings immigrated to Canada. Well, good luck, Shirley, uh, in researching them. Hopefully, you get a chance to explore um, and get to know Canadian records. I think Canadian research is actually quite interesting. Um, they're the history of the country, but also just their connection back and forth to um, to the UK is, is to me, is very interesting to research. Um, what other comments do we have from this, this week's new records? Liam saying cursing on the Sabbath. Yeah, well, you know, you can't do that, right? Um, <laughs> um, um, Anya is still continuing to try to teach me how to say things. Someday. I'll I'll get there someday. Um, all right. That looks like it for comments. So um, let's go into the question of the week. Um, uh, hide this. Right. This is it's a fun question. And also, I love this photograph. Um, so the question of the week. Imagine you had a time machine and could witness one event from your family's past. Which event would you choose and why? Um, and I'm going to go through your comments and we're going to talk about some stories you guys have, but I want to just take a second to appreciate this photograph. This is from the Find My Past photo collection. I love this machine, uh, whatever this thing is. Um, the caption for this particular image is on the bottom of the screen there, but um, it says missing inventory mystery, the perpetual motion machine, which is unfinished. Uh, invented by Mr. T. M. Harris, who disappeared four years ago after assembling it at the Motor Works of Clement Talbot Limited on 11th February 1924. Missing inventor, who I just the whole thing here is incredible. If I had had time to dig into this before the broadcast started, you know I would have, but. I think this is my new favorite image from the Find My Best Photo Collection, and I have a lot. Um, I mean, just look at that guy's face. Like, he is like perplexed, and um, I think he's confused, but he's very serious about it. And like the machine itself is like, just a piece of art, right? <laughs> oh yeah, okay. Andrew's saying he ran away because it didn't work. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I just think this thing is incredible. Um, so yeah. 
uh yeah i just i i could just like talk about this photograph for for an hour <laughs> um oh yeah gail okay so this could be part of a boat that you wouldn't need to row maybe maybe um i haven't even done it so much as a google search on this or anything so um yeah you guys but you I mean, you know, I will. But if you get a second, plop it into Google and see if if anything pops up. I would love to know. I just think it, and and I agree. Anya, it looks like a modern art installation. I would love to see this in an art gallery or museum somewhere. And I do wonder what happened to it. Like, where is the machine today? Like, did it survive all, all those things? Did they take it apart and you know use the parts for something during the war or something? Ah, such good stuff. Okay, um, so uh, we're gonna take that down and we're gonna put the question of the week on the screen and and we're gonna start looking at your guys' comments and see what you, where would you, what would, oh, man, where would you go? Who would you see and what part of their life? So I'm gonna start back at the top of the list and see if we can find the early entries who was who was fast on the draw this morning or this afternoon depending on where you are in the world um <laughs> gail gail looks like the first one in i would like to visit king david i would like to listen to him read and talk about god it, okay i mean starting big we're starting really big um <laughs> janet came in with um, the baptism of my four times great grandfather to ask why, why they named him. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's a good question. And I, I feel like you've mentioned him before um, on the chat, Janet, I, I feel like I remember this. Um, I would want to know that too. <laughs> um, cool. Sue, I would like to witness the admission into North Dublin workhouse of my great grandmother. And then I could find out where she came from and maybe who her parents were. Oh, so that's interesting. Um, to actually witness the admission. Um, so I was actually, I was reading through this text last week. I, I think I finished it last week. Um, and they were talking about workhouses and how these um, basically media people um, and news reporters would, would pretend to be poor and go like, put themselves in the workhouse for a night or two or a week or whatever, and to, to report back on and see what it was really like. And they were talking about how you couldn't go into the workhouse with anything of value, right? So people would, before they actually got to the front door, if you will, um, they would dig a little hole in the ground and bury anything of value that they had so that it didn't get confiscated when they went into the workhouse. And then the locals obviously all knew about that and they would go find these little like treasure troves of uh, whatever they were and and steal this stuff um and and it really like just that one story i mean there was a whole lot about of context around the workhouse and and what these reporters did but just that one little moment i was like wow so you're already at like the very bottom level of your life right you're struggling in a big way and then you get the last couple little things that you have left um then get stolen <laughs> that's harsh that's bad um so i think that would be quite a moment to see sue i think it would be quite a moment to see someone actually enter into a workhouse and 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 work through that process um gail also comments i would have also like to see the queen and just sit and talk to her yeah um definitely i think some of those big historical figures um would really be interesting to work with like i think one of mine would probably be alexander hamilton not a huge surprise because i'm a big revolutionary war fan and and a fan of hamilton's um but he was such an incredible thinker so yeah i would definitely like to just sit and talk to him but i'm not related to him so um i can't actually use him as my question of the week this 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 week um kim saying so difficult to choose I agree. How, however, I would choose the first meeting of my mom and late dad. Would be wonderful to see them when younger. That's really sweet. Okay, yeah. Um, gosh, yeah, that's a good moment. I, I like that, Kim. I like that choice a lot. It's very like it's very personal. Obviously, it's very heartwarming. Um, but also to see them in a context that we don't appreciate our parents in, right? To see our parents as young people, as twenty somethings or whatever, um, kind of meeting for the first time, falling in love, um, finding compatibility, you know, finding those, those connections, um, between the two of them that lead to eventual 
you know, marriage and, and family. Um, yeah, I think that's a, a really nice moment. I was trying to think about my parents the first time they met, but it was actually over ham radio. Um, so I think if I was going to do this, I would say the first time they met in person versus the first time they met, I would have to specify because my parents had a very different um, a kind of courtship, if you will. Um, okay, Jillian, also with her parents, I'd go back to my mom and dad's 25th wedding anniversary as all the relatives were still alive and would ask loads of questions about their lives. So that's a good choice um, because you're going to one specific event, but you're actually opening the door for a whole lot of opportunity in terms of, of ancestors, right? So you're hitting one one event in your time machine, um, but you're you're getting a second chance at like a whole slew of people. Good shout. This is, that's a strong choice for sure. In that case, I think it would be my grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary, I think. It would be my my um, mirror event, I guess, to that. So Karen would go back to 1835 London, could visit both brick wall third great grandfathers and ask their parents' name, and then would have a full set of fourth greats. And you know what? While you're there, ask them about their grandparents' names too. So then you have five, you know, fifth grades. <laughs> That's a good choice. 1835 London. It's depend on where you are in the city, but it could be quite dangerous. Potential for disease there, right? But we're, we're relatively, um, you know, inoculated and vaccinated now. So hopefully, hopefully you'd get through that experience well. I think about that a lot. When I think about time travel, I think about like, what risk am I putting myself in? Am I going to get scarlet fever or something while I'm, while I'm back in time for a day? Um, and then, you know, come forward in time and like, Am I going to be okay? <laughs> like, there's repercussions to time travel, I feel like. Um, okay. Lynn, I would like to travel to Dollar. Yeah, that stopped me. Clackmanshire? Cl in 1834. And see William Rankin and Mary Patterson. I want to know some information for him as he died in 19 1848. So just a uh, just over a decade later, when his youngest daughter was just a week old. Oh, and he did have the nerve to die before the 1851 census. And he was a coal miner. That would be just an interesting experiment in like average daily life in the mid 1800s. I think that would be interesting. Um, I really hate it when they miss the census, right? Like, so I was researching somebody yesterday, the day before, and I don't remember, but um, they missed the 1911 census by like three weeks or something. They were born three weeks after the census. And I was like, really? Really? You couldn't have been born just a little bit earlier and help me out here? Um, all right. <laughs> Ellie chiming in as well, inspired by Jillian. Um, so another um, anniversary of it, 50th wedding anniversary of her two times great grandparents. She has a photo um, with so many people. It would be amazing to chat with them. I That's great. I like that. I would totally take the photo and just be like, right, you're in this picture. It hasn't been taken yet. We're going to take this picture later today. And I would like to know what your name is, please, and your relation to X. <laughs> like, it's just like, wouldn't that be incredible to just walk into an event and be like, I have photographic evidence that this event happened, but the photo is going to be taken in like six hours. Great. Can we just write down your name? <laughs> That's cool. Um, okay. Good choice, Ellie. Good choice. Janet, um, also. Hmm. Okay. I think I'm back. <laughs> that was... Guys, why does technology, I swear, I have had lots of gremlins this morning. Um, hopefully, I, hopefully I'm back. I don't know. Someone tell me if I'm back or not. Mm. Okay, I'm back. Thank you, Ellie. I don't know where I went. It just shut down and I like, maybe I did just time. Oh, oh, good. Um, that was, that was weird. And did I just time travel? I don't remember going back in time, but maybe. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I told you guys it'd been a long week. <laughs> that is just proof, I guess. Um, wow. Okay. Let me see. Oh, if I can find where we were, that was, um, sorry about that. I have no idea what just happened. Um, I had just finished going through Ellie's comment about question of the week. Um, 
Oh, and I don't think it's actually even showing me all the comments now. I think it like messed it up. So I don't think I have access to everything that you guys have posted. So I will just start with what I can start with. I don't, I'm really sorry. I don't know what's going on. Um, so we'll just pick back up with Ellen. Um, and I think I've missed a couple of people. So I'm going to apologize for that. So um, Ellen says she would go back to the first Mayflower winter of 1620 and see how 10th great grandmother Eleanor Billington survived it when most of the other women died. Um, and yeah, 72% of the women died. Um, she had to be extra tough. Yeah, Ellen. I think that's another one for me that would have been on the list, although I probably would have done um, just slightly later. Uh, I didn't have anybody on the Mayflower, but I had somebody over in 1635. And so, you know, 15 years later, things are a little bit more settled. Um, and my family was in Lynn, Massachusetts, just near there. So um, yeah, definitely, definitely would have been interesting to see how they survived those experiences. Um, and I might've even picked the moment they got on board the boat, right? Like um, what the journey itself, because that would have been something as well. But yeah, I think I think the Mayflower winter of 1620 would, would be a really striking one to experience. Um, Kim, I have to know this story. Um, if you could interact with an ancestor, then it would be a visit to my fourth great grandmother. I'd convince her not to put arsenic in the cake. Are you serious? <laughs> Cause wow. I got to know that. I have to know what that story is. Um, you should, you should, that is amazing. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't even know what, I don't even know how to respond to that. Um, James would go back in time to the ship, the American Congress, which departed somewhere in London to know the Harrow ancestors of my third great grandmother. Yeah. I think going on a ship, being on the voyage with them would actually be like really close to the top of my list too, James. Like, because do you get to, like, you know, maybe if you're time traveling, you can choose how long you're back there. So, like, you know, would you just live through the whole voyage so you have dedicated time with them? And, like, they can't go anywhere, right? Like, they have to answer your questions because they're stuck on the boat. <laughs> All right, Joe. Um, so many options to choose from. Yep, absolutely. I'd like to go back and meet my great great granddad and try to help him with his shell shock. Okay, interesting. He was in and out of institutions after World War One. struggled when all three of his sons were in World War II. His eldest son died as a rear gunner in a Lancaster bomber. Um, yeah. I, you know what? That's really, that's quite a statement, Joe. Um, I'm going to have to think about that one for a minute because, yeah, we know a lot more about shell shock or, or post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, how, you know, that we would refer to it now. Wait, we know a lot more about that and how to be healthier in that environment. So yeah, could you go back in time travel and, and help somebody with that type of condition or some other medical situation? Like, hmm, what an interesting observation, Joe. I like that one. Very good thinking. Um, Anya, we go back to visit her two times great grandmother just before she gave my great granny up for adoption and just give her a massive hug. That's really sweet. She was so young and was sent away from her family. Poor girl definitely needed a hug. Yeah. Yeah. And that kind of makes me think like I, hmm, if we had the power to time travel, would we change things? Right? Like, um, so your comment Anya, makes me think of all of those thousands of children that were sent as British home children to Canada and Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and other parts of the empire. Um, and many of them were treated in a, you know, in a very poor way. Um, and they were separated from their families and siblings. And sometimes their families didn't even give permission for them to go. And, and, and it's all very, very sad and traumatic. And so would you go back in time to the people who came up with that idea and just be like, actually, no, this is really bad. Don't do this. Let's find another option for these kids. I wonder. I wonder. Um, Jean comments, although I have relatives on my maternal side going back to 1066, who are Sir Baron's lords. I would like to go back to 1891 when my two times great grandfather, James Dean, on my paternal side, who was one of my one of the travelers that formed the Van Dwellers Association and stood up in Parliament to fight for their rights? Okay, interesting. So you would go back to um, James Dean, which is a great name, um, and and talk to him about his experience as a, yeah, a political activist, essentially. Um, 
That's fantastic. That's great. Oh, that's a moment in history to, to really capture. I think, I think for sure. Um, <laughs> Andrew, this is a good one. This is definitely like that. All of your senses being brought into your memory banks, right? I'd love to sit in on my great, great aunt Eunice being taught how to make pastry. Her apple pies were to die for. That's great. Um, I love that. Um, and Anya adding, feeding on to that, wishing you how to make my Nana's Yorkshire puddings. Yeah, I, I think, um, uh, the baking, right? Because I mean, when you bake something, the kitchen just fills with all the smells and you can, you can remember it and you have it in your memory banks, but you can smell it. You can almost taste it. Right. And like, yeah, apple pies. Mm, that's a good idea. Apple pie. I should bake something this weekend. <laughs> Um, okay. And then Joe adds on to this conversation about baking, right? It's a good point. Hadn't thought about that. Grandma's Yorkshire puddings would be worth traveling back for. <laughs> yeah. I think my grandma's cookies, maybe that's tempting. That's a good idea. I, I'm liking this. I'm liking this thread. Uh, Christine would go back to her parents' wedding because all of the great grandparents were there and I would be able to knock down some Irish brick walls. Maybe would we go back, would we all go back to the, the places of, I mean, we didn't talk about, this isn't the question. The question is around ancestors, but would we all go back to a moment in time and explore how to prevent record loss, right? How many of us would go back to Ireland in 1922 and be like, take these papers out of this building. It's going to blow up soon. Um, or <laughs> the fire that destroyed the 19, uh, 1890 U.S. Census. Yeah. Um, more, more memories around food. This is good. Ellen's grandfather's ravioli. Can we get all these people together, right? Like, um, let's get the people who make the Yorkshire puddings and the people who make the apple pies and the, and the, and the ravioli, the grandfather with the ravioli. And let's, let's, let's get them all in one place and have a big lunch. Everybody up for that? Are we, are we doing that? <laughs> um, that would be good. Ra is saying he would, she would like to meet um, great grandfather. He was a color sergeant in the Royal Marines and his service must have been interesting. Definitely agree. Um, oh, yep. Anya saying uh, definitely need to have your shots before traveling back. Okay. And then in the comments, that is where I disappeared. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> All right. Um, picking back up on, on, I'm scrolling through the thread and like watching, uh, looking at all of your comments about me disappearing. Great. Um, Pickles would like to go back to my maternal granddad's first day at school circa 1906 for two reasons. I like this. I like that there's an explanation here. First, because he died a month after I was born and I only know what my older brothers remember of him as an old man. So I would love to see him as a child. That's great. And then secondly, as someone who spent their life working in education, I would love to see a school life back then in a small rural village where children left age 12 to start work. I think that is really well thought out, actually. Um, yeah, it's good to it's good to see them in their real world environment. And, and in this case, right, we've talked about going back and seeing our parents before they were parents and like seeing them as a younger couple, but in this case, we're going back actually to childhood and seeing them in that village school environment and that village environment just as a whole. I think that would be really interesting. Um, okay. Um, so that's a good choice. I think that's a good one. Um, Myra, Moira, uh, I apologize if I said that wrong, um, would meet up with her two times great grandparents, Michael and Anne Headley um, uh, Robley and see what old man Sheil was like when it was occupied and lived in and talk with my ancestors and discover that the whole family were like as people to wonder at the view then from this cottage. Um, also to see the rector of Falstern Church, William Robley, his wife is buried in Simon Byrne Parish Churchyard, which was one of the largest parishes, another ancestor and related to Anne Robley. <laughs> That's confusing. Sorry. I think this would make more sense if I knew what old man Sheil was. And that is one of the drawbacks, right, of not being in in the UK, like embraced and, and embedded in the culture over there. But um, I will have to Google it now. Um, but I think that that's great, right? You want to live their experience. You want to see their world through their eyes. Like, I mean, quite literally, right? Can't get like, does it get better than that? Like, we try to do that through our research. We uh, make those attempts, but um, but walking and you know, 
seeing it for reals would be a, a whole different a whole different ball game. Okay, Maurice, another good one. Well thought out, it looks like. Back to a court in Chelmsford in Essex, 1836. Two times great-grandmother at the age of 11 years was um, one of three girls who were sexually assaulted and the judge claimed she consented. Okay, Maurice. Yeah, that's big and heavy. The case was proved against assailant and at that time would have attracted the death penalty, but the case against him was dismissed. Yeah. There's a lot there. That's, that's a lot to unpack, right? First, you want to go back and defend these three little girls. Um, gosh. Yeah. And then you want to make sure that the, the, the bad guy actually gets what's do him. I'm just going to say that. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Maurice, for sharing that. Um, because it, uh, while we've had a good time talking about time travel, this really does bring it back to reality, right? And like, um, family history is fun and exciting and it can be really, really interesting, but there can also be moments that we uncover that we're just like, wow, what do I do with this? Um, and, and it can be incredibly emotional and it can be um, a moment when we really kind of have to sit back and think about the reality of life of our ancestors. So Maurice, thank you for sharing that story with us um, because I think it's incredibly important that we acknowledge all the stories. Um, we can't hide from those stories. Um, we can't hide what happened to our ancestors or the choices they made, um, but we do have to, to tell those stories to really understand history as it actually was. So I think that's an important one. I really do. Um, okay. How much, oh, yeah. You, and these are still coming fast and furious. Um, uh, right. So I'm, <laughs> I'm going to try to get through as many as I can, but I can't promise that I will. Karen reminds us of a good rule for time travel. Not supposed to change events can cause catastrophic chaos. I think that's true. Um, but I do wonder if the chaos would end up being any better or worse. I don't know. There's all sorts of Hollywood references to this, right? Like, um, but it, yeah, always makes it an interesting discussion. Okay. Joe, second choice, traveling back to 1700 to find my ancestor, Robert Darwin, and how he ended up dying in a debtor's prison in London in 1749. What did he do with the money? So he came from money? He had money? And then he didn't have money? I, I am inferring um, from your comments. Um, um, so that sounds like an interesting story. I definitely got distracted by some of the other comments. Sorry about that. Hello, pause there. Um, yeah, I want to know how he ended up in debtor's prison as well. So Joe, keep us posted on this one. Um, if you ever find anything that would be really interesting to know. Um, Gail, this is, i didn't know this. Um, I would like to see my dad's side of the families that came over on the ships and landed in America. Ellis Island was named after them. I don't think I've ever even thought about how Ellis Island got its name. I definitely want to know more about that, Gail. These stories are incredible, first of all. Um, I'm really glad I asked these this question this week. Um, okay, Ellen also has ancestors in Lynn, Massachusetts. Um, wonder if they knew each other. Probably did. It was a pretty small place at that time. Um, and I actually just learned, Ellen, you probably have seen or heard of Randy Seaver, um, who's a, a pretty well-known genealogist out in California, right? Um, uh, was a speaker for many years and writes a very prolific blog. Really wonderful guy. And um, he and I actually share an ancestor. We just learned that this week. Um, and it was the the family that came over to Lynn, uh, Massachusetts in 1635. So Randy Seaver and I are cousins, um, right? Very distant, but that was fun to learn about. And of course it all kind of, uh, the US story at least all starts in Lynn. So that's fun. Um, okay, um, Karen, I would love to go back to around 1920 to meet the three grandparents I never knew and great grandparents who were still alive. Maternal granddad would have just come back from Egypt after the war and a great, great granddad also died in 21. So it would be amazing to meet him. And like Anya, I'd love to give them all a hug. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, um, you know, I, it's, it's interesting how many comments there are about the hugs. Um, and I think that is a, a bit of family history as well, right? We, we researched these individuals having never actually met them in real life. And, 
form an emotional connection to them. I think that's very um, natural, but also very um, common across those of us who embrace this hobby. Um, and so it, it, I do definitely think about like, how would I react if I were to meet my second or third times great grandfather that I feel like I know, but in reality never actually met, right? Or heard his voice or anything like that. I think that's that's an interesting point that you guys are bringing up. Um, Rosie would go back to any point in my Irish ancestors' lives before about 1856 to see exactly how they managed to survive the famine. Yeah, okay. I love that. That's um, also kind of seeing it through their eyes and understanding their world in a very different way. Um, it's good. It's good. Going back to baking, Ellie is going to bake a Victoria sponge. I don't know what that is. Ellie, you're going to have to inform me. You're going to have to teach me about that one. That's a part of culture I haven't gotten to yet. Uh, we're all making Victoria hungry. So we're doing our jobs. Good job. <laughs> um, okay. Um, but we are not going to bake Kim's fourth great grandmother's arsenic laced plum cake. That is that is a no. She's not invited to the banquet. <laughs> um, Kim, we're going to have to ask your your fourth times great grandmother to not bring anything. Right? <laughs> um, okay, cool. Um, <laughs> but but arsenic free plum cake sounds good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's great. We are going to have to have a big giant family reunion. And everybody's going to bring their family recipe. I think we should definitely do that. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Um, a question of the week from Moira. My hubby would like to accompany. Oh, oh. so this is now your husband's um, response. That's great. Would like to accompany his two times great aunt Isabella Simpson Rodham. Uh, Bell, to, uh, Bell Rodham, to help with her children on her way to Scranton, Pennsylvania in 1881 to join her husband, who was a coal miner. She was um, the two-time great-grandfather's sister who originated from Anfield Plain, County Durham. She inherited a property from her father who left all his daughters a property or maybe two. He was a pit deputy and also owned uh, a pub. Very cool. Um, Um, right. Okay, let's see. Uh, oh, let's go back to Ellis Island. So Gail saying Ellis is my maiden name. Ellis is just one of the variations of Els. One of my distant cousins still lives in England. Oh, cool. Um, that's fantastic. You should try to get together. Um, oh, great. Victoria sandwich. Perfect. Two layers of sponge with cream and jam in the middle. Okay. I think I could probably handle making that this weekend too. <laughs> Fun. Good. Thanks for that. Victoria sponge has no fat in it. Oh, well, I mean, now, now we're really talking here. That would, that would be great. Let's, let's keep going with that. Okay. Let's see. I think I am getting towards the end of um, the questions of the week. So that's good. Um, I don't see any more, but that's okay. Oh, yeah. Obviously, there's going to be more. Right. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. Um, this is a fun one. I like this. I would also love to have a drink with my three times grand granddad. He was the landlord of the Golden Eagle in Macclesfield, Cheshire in 1881. I've been doing research around the Macclesfield area this week. Actually, that's cool. Nice to have. I actually know where that is <laughs> and like have a sense of, of context there. That's good. Thanks, Karen, for that. I think. So I've been thinking about this. I'm like, how I'm going to answer this question because I haven't actually answered this question yet. Um, oops. Uh, let me. I'm going to take this off because it's kind of distracting, um, and I feel like it covers. It goes right up to my chin, right? So it doesn't. It's not. It doesn't make for the best video. Um, I think if I had to choose one, one event. I would go back to the Second Battle of Manassas, uh, which was part of the U.S. Civil War. Um, and the reason I think I would choose that moment, well, so there's two of these moments in my family history, and it makes it really hard. Um, so I had an ancestor who was fighting for the Union, and I had an ancestor who was fighting for the Confederacy. And in that battle, their units were lined up against each other. 
And somehow they both walked off that field that day. Um, and I would like to speak to them together and understand why they were fighting for the side they were fighting for, right? And, and could the three of us sit down on that battlefield and actually find common ground, right? Now, at the time, obviously, they didn't know that they would eventually be relation by marriage. Um, it, it took down to my parents getting married for those two families to come together in some way. Um, but I think I would like to sit down and just, and just have that conversation and understand why they were there. Um, doing what they were doing. I think I could probably make reasonable hypothesis on that myself. Um, I know enough about both of them that I feel like I could do that, but I would love to just hear it from their own words. And I would love for those two men to look each other in the eye and say, if one of you didn't walk off this field because of the other one's actions today, I wouldn't actually ever come about, right? Um, Jen Baldwin would never have happened. Um, and so, so what is that moment like? Um, I think that would be my first choice. My second choice is very similar um, in that I had an ancestor who um, was really heavily involved in industry in um, Southern Ohio in the early 1800s. Um, and he was pretty influential. Um, they made cast iron, his companies made cast iron. Um, and so he ran foundries and they hosted at one point um, an organ a organization of writers and newspaper reporters in his town that he was in Cincinnati. Okay. And they hosted this organization of reporters that went around and toured um, uh, the sights and sounds of Cincinnati for a week. And they, this organization moved all over uh, every year. They had a, a, a different venue um, and they would see things and, and talk to different people and whatever my, so the, the, I'm not explaining this very well. A cast iron guy was on my mom's side of the family. I had a newspaper reporter and publisher on my dad's side of the family. So very similar thing. Um, and he was in Northern Ohio. And so he traveled to Cincinnati for this week long, like convention basically. And my ancestor served my other ancestor, a glass of champagne. Um, and they're, you know, it's one of those events where you're like trying to schmooze the press basically. And, and they were doing that. And again, didn't know that they would eventually be connected by marriage until my parents came around. Um, but I would have loved to have seen my one ancestor who was this wealthy, influential businessman trying to schmooze my other ancestor, who was this press guy, right. With the media. Um, and Yeah. It just, I, I just think that, so I have like a civil war moment where I would have been like, this is really big and heavy. And then I have this other, but like, I want a glass of champagne too. And let's like chill and talk to each other for a while. Um, yeah. So I think those would be my top two moments. Um, if I had to choose, if I had that time machine and Linda's really saying it, it well, right. Um, she says, we are all only here due to these tiny bits of luck. Yeah. That's that pretty much wraps it up. So Linda wouldn't be here if her nan hadn't been shielded by a door during a bombing raid. That's that's a moment to capture for sure. Um, so with that, I think we've had a fun journey in our time machine today. Um, and I appreciate you all kind of experimenting on this idea with me. Um, it's been great, actually. It's been fun to kind of see your stories come out through this concept. Um, there are a handful of you that should really be communicating <laughs> these stories. Um, we, again, as always, right, we would love to to be able to share your stories in some capacity. This community is so important to us and we really wanna brag about you guys um, and the research that you do. So if you are willing, to share your stories with us, please do. Uh, please do so. You can re reach us at discoveries at findmypast.com, um, and um, and and send us kind of some of these stories would be would be a lot of fun. Um, we hope that you have a wonderful weekend. We will be back, of course, next week with new records, um, as always, and um, hope that you have a great time kind of honoring and celebrating your ancestors this week and that you make some more cool discoveries. So keep those thinking caps on, get back in that that travel machine, that time travel session, and, um, and see what else you can discover, right? Um, so thanks very much, and hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.